This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Please rise for the pledge of the flag. Are we in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, we are. Um, can we have a roll call and verification of a quorum? Commissioner Duex? Here. Commissioner Hambuck Boyle? Absent. Commissioner Harder? Here. Commissioner Luganville? Here. Commissioner Vu? Here. Commissioner Torres? Here. Commissioner Bika? Here. Thank you. I have to turn on the mic. That's the first. <laughs> okay, first mistake. <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, welcome to the board meeting, and uh, we will have the public forum now. We have two speakers, and they may have uh, four minutes each. Please state your name and your address. Uh, Mark Goings. Good evening. Um, my name is Mark Goings. I live at E17450 County Road V in Augusta, Wisconsin. And I, I'm speaking to the board tonight on um, it, it, with concerns about um, page three of the, uh, of the handbook changes. Um, item three where it says the board reserves the right to collect money related to professional development. That item, that's, I asked uh, Patty if she could call that up at the board, so it's the blue item there. And um, I did talk with uh, Ms. March earlier today about this item, and uh, we we discussed it. And uh, she does, and there is does seem like there's um, that she's open to um, language changes, that sort of thing. Not tonight, language changes that we need to have time to look at this more thoroughly. But the reason I wanted to look at that is for one thing, um, it refers to professional development. Well, we are continually training our staff. So that could, that could technically could apply to PD Wednesdays or PD IP days. Um, that the board could, at the end of the year, say, hey, we're going to recruit all those funds. There's also trainings that people go to where, you know, that, that a principal might say, hey, um, that um, we, we, we'd like to form a team to go to CESA and learn about PBIS. There again, you know, that's technically a professional development training. And one of the things that we do very well here in our district is we try to do what's best for students. And so I would want to think that, hey, if, if at, at one of the high schools that, that they needed, uh, that they had more sections for AP, you know, Calc, and the principal said, hey, would you be willing to get trained in this? That the person would think, hey, you know what, I'd be willing to do that. But I would hate to have it become an atmosphere of, hey, at the end of the year, I'm retiring and now I owe for my training. Um, similar like with our mentor training. If you have a senior teacher who's asked to mentor a new professional to take that training again if they leave at the end of the year. And again, this does not say that they, those funds would be sought. But it says that it could be sought. And I'm speaking to this board, and as you are all very well aware, you know, we have a board election coming up. And so uh, the board could look very different very soon. Um, same thing within, with administration. Now, in our collective wisdom, we, we may say we're not going to apply it like that. But our handbook is, becomes the basis for future, just for future thoughts. And one other thing I would relate on this is in, on page 64 of the handbook, which is, in, 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 which is a section that, that talks about non-affiliated, so principals, um, directors, executive directors. There's a section, section three, talks about requirement to stay current or to remain current. I think it's important that our teaching staff also stays current. This section right here is in the teaching section, uh, which is another oddity of this. Say if an if a executive director brought a team of three to go to a training in 
you know, Chicago on school safety. At, at the end of that year, if they all left, the only people that would be subject to a potential penalty would be the teaching staff. To me, that seems quite odd. I ask that the board um, pull that one item from tonight's discussion um, so we can look at this. Because ultimately, in the big scheme of things, we need to grow together. Because that's what benefits our students most. Thank you very much. So let's name that right now so we can pull it when we get to it. So it's uh, page three. And what item is that? Number three. Thank you, Mark. And the next person to speak is Dan Wilson. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Dan Wilson, 3753 Patton Street, Eau Claire. Um, I just want to take a couple minutes of your time tonight to address um, the insurance bid that was approved at the last meeting. Um, it was stated um, that the increase to staff would be minimal, ranging from an annual increase of $36 for a single to $120 for a family. It was also stated that the deductible would be rising to $4,000, $8,000 from $3,000, $6,000. What wasn't mentioned, or mentioned clearly, was that that increase of $2,000 in deductible would fall solely on the employee's responsibility. In the past, we've had the bridge that shared the deductible cost 50-50. Um, but to my knowledge, the bridge is not increasing to cover the difference in deductibles. I may be wrong on that, but that was my understanding from the presentation, that the bridge was going to stay the same. The deductibles went up $2,000. So I just wanted to point out that that increase in cost to an employee could be far more than the $36 and $120 when we look at the increase in deductible. Lastly, I just kind of want to express my frustration with the new process of the insurance bid approval. I've been on the insurance slash holistic committee, to my recollection, close to 12 years. That's a lot of time and effort that I've put in to that committee to kind of make sure that all the ideas are explored all the thoughts are there to help reduce costs across the board. This year, that process did not happen, and the, employee, and the employee's voice in this insurance process was not included. The first time, um, as a committee member, first time I saw the numbers was when they were presented here at the board two weeks ago. So just personally, I just want to express a little frustration of the new bid process and hopefully going forward that's something that can be looked at to rechange that process going forward thank you for your time thank you dr hardebeck may we have your report so good evening everyone uh, i'd like to up uh, to review the upcoming Board of Education events. On March 28th, there will be a meeting of the Budget Development Committee at 11.30 a.m. and on March 29th, there will be a meeting of the Demographic Trends Committee at 4.30. Both of those meetings will take place in the Administration Building. On April 2nd, um, the Policy and Governance Committee will meet at 8.45 a.m. in the Administration Building. And there will be a regular meeting of the Board of Education on at 7 p.m. that evening at the administration building. Then on April 3rd, there is a meeting of the Parent Advisory Council. That's at 7 p.m. On April 4th, there's a meeting of the Budget Development Committee, and that takes place at 11.30 a.m. On April 5th, there are the Golden Apple Awards, which are at 5.30 p.m. at the Wild Ridge Country Club. And on April 16th, there's another meeting of the Policy and Governance Committee, followed by a school board meeting later that evening at 7 p.m. Those meetings take place in the administration building. So um, March 9th, um, there was an amazing concert at North High School, and it was performed by the Adaptive Music class. 
and um, several of us were able to watch the performance, but some of us were not able to attend, especially board members. So we have just a little uh, preview of that concert for you, and Patty is going to run the slideshow for you. Well, I'm already teared up because I was there and I saw lots and lots of smiles. And I'm a musician and I know how hard it is to do everything together. And they did it together. They ended on time. They started on time. They were smiling. And Shauna, I can't think of her last name. Yeah, she, she did a great job and built on what Linda Johnson had done so many years. So it was exciting, folks. If you get if you get to hear another one of those, just go. The most one of the most exciting things too were the other students in the high school. There were, the auditorium was filled, and every time anybody said anything or performed anything, the applause was ample, and just reinforcing those kids. So 
Bravo. North High. Okay. So thank you. I, I, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> this, I was hoping we'd get a little snippet of the performance, but you could see the preparation that went into it. They practiced for almost a year to put their concert on, so a lot of hard work and, 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 and good work there. Um, so leaving something so inspirational to talk once again about school safety is uh, not the kind of transition that I like to make in these kinds of reports. But, you know, as reported in the media last week, a group of students at Memorial made a threat to the school staff and students. And here's what we know to this point. Four students, three males and one female, all 15 years old, were apparently planning an alleged attack through a Facebook Messenger social media application. And this app is a private messaging application that allows individuals to converse with another person or groups of other people. And through a group message that spanned many days, there were discussions regarding the date of the event that would take place, some specific statements uh, related to their plan, and photographs of firearms. And according to the uh, Eau Claire Police Department, the guns in the photographs were real and the students had access to them. School administrators learned of the messages from a parent of a student who was aware of the messages. And the administrators at Memorial immediately contacted police. Working together, school administrators and police investigated during spring break and took um, legal action with the students. And at this point, it is a police matter. I think it's, once again, important uh, to stress that um, everyone in the community um, to know that we take all threats uh, seriously. And we rely um, on the Eau Claire Police Department to advise and assist us in helping to confront threats and to maintain the safety of our students and staff. As in other recent incidents, we learned of this latest threat through a student who thought something was suspicious and told an adult who passed the information on to those who had the authority to investigate it. And we are grateful to this family uh, for coming forward because, and especially to the student, because it takes a lot of courage to come forward. Um, we since learned that other students may have known about the messages and did not report them. And this behavior is just as disturbing as hearing about the threats themselves. We can only ask ourselves what might have happened had someone failed to report this incident. So we once again asking all families and all in the community to help us. We're asking parents to please continue to talk to their children about being alert to anything that seems suspicious or out of the ordinary. And to really think about whether something is going on at school that adults need to know about or something that's going on with other students that adults can help with. Um, I think we have to let our no students know that it's not only okay, but that it's important for them to talk to a trusted adult about what they are seeing at school. Uh, that we all share a responsibility to keep um, ourselves and others safe. It's been my experience with students who are considering any kind of uh, violence or action or uh, some type of dramatic step that they almost always confide in someone else about their intentions. So it's important that when this happens with students that they come forward and tell us about this. Um, and it's also important that students understand the consequences that they might face when they make threats to other students or to the school. In the short term, making threats can result in an arrest, expulsion from school, sometimes even imprisonment. In the long term, students may not be allowed to complete their education, may not be eligible to hold certain jobs, or might even lose their right to vote. 
it is critical that students understand that making a threat is nothing to play with or to joke about. And this is something that our staff continues to stress with students. We want families to know that if their students are fearful about going to school or are showing signs of distress, such as sleeplessness, lack of appetite, acting out, or a kind of a general overall sadness, that parents and families can contact their principals for advice and support. We want to know our students' concerns so that we can provide help to them to be healthy and safe. And we also want our families to feel free to contact me or school board members personally if they have questions, concerns, or ideas to share. And once again, I find myself in the place of saying that as a community, we're all in this together. And we are deeply grateful for the help and the advice and the communication that we've received from the police department, from our staff, from our families, and especially from our students. So I guess we're living in uncertain times. We want to be able to reassure families and students and staff that they are safe in our schools. This is a team effort, and we all have to be vigilant and alert. Thank you, Dr. Hardeback. Um, Chris Hambuck Boyle, you're the president of the board, has sent me her report, and uh, she has a lot in there. She said she just wanted to take a few minutes to report a few points taken from this year's 97th Annual State Education Convention. I thought we had already done some of this, but she, I talked to her today and she said, no, we hadn't done this. So it's, it's good to review some of what we learned in January. Our board agenda with closed sessions, meetings, and work sessions has been nonstop since Joe, Catherine, and I attended the conference in January. Mary Ann, Jim Schmidt, and Patty Everson attended as well. Repeatedly, sessions called on school leaders to rethink our schools in terms of how rapidly our world is evolving. We were challenged to continually assess how we develop and support learners who will thrive in our ever-changing world. Dr. Bill Daggett, founder and chairman of the International Center for Leadership in Education, said that schools must change to meet the demands of the fourth industrial revolution that the world is entering into. Constant rapid advances in technology, in particular robotics, biomedical systems, and nanotechnology are making jobs and whole occupations ob obsolete. He said that a rapid change in the workplace uh, is beneficial to emphasize skills like critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving, superseding teaching and testing students on facts and figures. You need knowledge and how to apply it. The ECASD is well poised for this. One other session to highlight is good practices are for good students. Research shows that board governance and consistent policy making translates into meaningful student gains. In a series of studies on school boards and their members, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee professor Douglas Erke and UW Oshkosh professor Michael Ford found that adherence to a governance model or philosophy over time allow consistent policy making and policy alignment with school staff that translates into real student gains. The ECASD school board is presently on the governance journey and will be working within our policy and governance committee to tie down all the moving parts into a consistent way of doing business. Along with the completion of our board handbook, new members coming on the board should find the transition quite easy and accommodating. Hard work on this will take place over the next several months. The, board, uh, the board's recent self-evaluation pointed in this direction as well. Are there, uh, we have a school board election on Tuesday, April 3rd. So I want to remind you of that and introduce any of those who are um, running for school board. We have three incumbents, uh, Lori Bika, 
Joe Luganville and Eric Tortoise, who are running for re-election. Is Lori Klinkhammer here tonight? Joshua Clements? Tim Norton? Tim, have it stand up just please so people can see you. And John Pliwa, they are also running for school board. Thank you, Tim. We thank you for coming and for running for school board. The election, uh, as I said, is Tuesday, April 3rd. Board members need to know that there is a new board member meeting hosted by WASB on Tuesday, April uh, 17th, sorry, April 17th in Duran from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, we have a tradition of trying to get all of our board members to attend that with the incoming board members. So if you can make it, please let Chris know. On May 21 from 1 to 6, the Blue Ribbon Commission on Public School Funding will be at CESA 11 in Turtle Lake for a hearing. It is the closest that the panel will be to Eau Claire. Now is the time to plan your attendance. It is a school board meeting night, so we might think about changing our meeting or making sure we go early and get signed up to testify with plenty of time to get back to Eau Claire. I think she's already signed me up, even though I'm not going to be on the board after April. But I'm happy to go. Uh, so please let Chris know your thoughts on this and if you can testify. And she will help you prepare. Uh, and any staff or administration are welcome to come, too. Uh, she said, I'm letting you know now, so we have plenty of time to plan. In 1971, the National Association for the Education of Young Children established the Week of the Young Child, recognizing that the early childhood years, birth through age eight, lay the foundation for children's success in school and later life. It is a time to plan how we, as citizens of a community, of a state, and of a nation, will better meet the needs of all young children and their families. This year, it is April 16 to 20, there will be opportunities all during the month of April that will highlight our amazing early childhood community. Chris will keep the board posted on those opportunities by putting them on our Community Connection Google Doc. That's the end of the President's report. So we thank Chris for her wonderful work and, and having more data for us, even though she can't be here. We'll have the student representative report, and I think Lauren, Lauren's going to go first tonight. Yeah, good evening. Um, obviously, it's been a while since the last board meeting, and a lot has happened in that time. Uh, but I'd like to highlight the success that the national walkout was on Wednesday, March 14th. At Memorial, the walkout was led by student leaders Zariah Whitaker and Violet Kilmeray, who eloquently explained the purpose and significance of the walkout, the principles of peaceful protest, they honored the lives lost, and inspired students to continue speaking out about what they feel passionately about. Um, there was a strong community presence at the walkout, and students who participated really uh, appreciated the community support. Um, and as you all know, there was another very real threat posed towards Memorial High School for this Monday uh, today. But thanks to the actions of that student and their parents, law enforcement, and other school officials, Memorial was a safe place for students to attend today. And with that in mind, I support the drafted letter to parents on school safety. I think it's important that they know um, everything's being done that can be done to keep students safe at school. Um, and I think one of the most important things we can do is, as Dr. Hardebeck said, is continue to report suspicious and concerning behaviors because obviously that's what saved lives um, today. And in lighter news, I was excited to see that the academic recognition system was on the agenda for tonight, so it's exciting to see that begin to move forward. So that concludes my report. Good evening. Uh, just uh, coming up, I guess, a couple of meetings left for our stu us as student representatives. So uh, the one thing we're hoping to do, lastly, is tackle the uh, teacher evaluation stuff that we brought up earlier in the year. And I think through being with uh, Mr. Schmidt and Dr. Biko, we're going to look into that more in the weeks to come. <clears throat> as a student rep, I feel, or I believe that I must feel strongly about the topic of student safety. 
I hope that with the recent threats of memorial, there can be some sort of designated time, whether it's a homeroom, an English class, or a study hall, uh, to have an open dialogue between students and teachers. I, hope, I would hope that Dr. Hardebeck's list of potential ramifications of making a threat would be shared with the students in an effort to put an end to any thoughts of making such a threat, whether it's a joke or not. I believe that this would also be beneficial to ease the tenseness that is currently in the student body in Eau Claire schools. And one more thing, I think if people who were on the board last year, uh, I made a, <clears throat> I had a, I put a survey out last year and I asked board members for questions. I'm gonna do that again this year. Me and Lauren are gonna do that together. So if anybody has any questions, I'll send an email again this week. But if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, uh, reply to that email. Thank you. Thank you. Your, your work this year has been wonderful. We really appreciate all the things that you see from your own perspective and, and bring them to the board. Thank you so much. Now we'll go to uh, committee reports and I'll call on Aaron Harder, Commissioner. Good evening. Uh, the Budget Development Committee met uh, to continue the discussion on OPEB. Recently, in the, um, that was our primary topic and that conversation is continuing. We're having uh, our uh, advisor, uh, Linda Mont, will be coming to speak to us this Wednesday, March 28th. 11:30, I think is the yeah. Uh, with uh, what we what, what may be a, a final pass at this before we bring a recommendation to the full board. So um, uh, that's that's this Wednesday, and that's that's the main thing that's happening with budget. Yeah. No. Do you want to go ahead and give a report on Leap? Sure. And so the other th uh, committee I'm on is Leap and. Um, at uh, at our, our March meeting, which which happened uh, uh, last week, uh, we finalized a, a proposed action plan for moving forward. We've been sort of reviewing Leap's role in the district uh, at a kind of a high level uh, over the last several weeks. Um, I, my understanding is the executive team now has a copy of, of that proposed action plan and we're working to get a meeting with the exec team to provide some feedback on that plan. Uh, assuming that all happens in time, uh, then uh, we're aiming to, to present uh, some recommendations and some options to the board for moving forward with LEAP on April 16th. So, okay. that's what's Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Luganville, would you care to give a report on the Policy and Governance mm -hmm. Committee? Certainly. We met this morning and uh, we went over finalizing our draft of policy 445 on law enforcement officials and school resource officers. So we'll have that tonight for discussion and possible first reading. And we also discussed uh, some revisions to the facility use agreement, which we'll be bringing to a future board meeting. And I believe it also has to go to budget development first, too, for another change. Um, and future meetings, some of the things that we're going to be talking about are looking back at our discipline and uh, positive behavior interventions policy, as well as looking at uh, reviewing policies and protocols on school entrances. We just received a policy brief from uh, the School Board Association about that with some recommendations. So, Thank you. Are there any other committee reports? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to our legislative update and uh, Logan Bell as well. Okay, um, well, I have a couple updates for you. Um, we'll start at the federal level about the things that impact our schools. Um, last week on Friday, um, Congress approved a $1.3 trillion federal spending bill that continues to fund the federal government for the remainder of the 2018 budget year. Um, What's, what's notable for schools is um, it boosts investment in student mental health, increasing funding by about $700 million for a new grant program that schools can use for violence prevention, counseling, and crisis management. Um, so what this will look like is grants will be made available through the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, COPS, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the BGA, and they'll be awarded to local school districts for what they're calling evidence-based school safety programs. Um, so that may be something to have school districts in the state look at. Um, the new spending legislation also does increase spending at the U.S. Department of Education by $2.6 billion, and that includes increased funding for IDEA, special education, Title I, and Title IV block grants. Um, at the state level, 
uh, Governor Scott Walker signed a package of school safety provisions into law just a few days ago. The centerpiece of the plan is a $100 million grant program for school districts to pay for things like um, increased uh, safety related facility upgrades and increased staff training. The package also includes some new mandates. Um, which are not funded, but therefore increased school safety plans and re increased reporting mechanisms to law enforcement by school staff who hear students make threats of violence in uh, or targeted at a school or school event. Um, as far as school funding and that advocacy, as I think you mentioned, the Blue Ribbon Commission is not coming to Eau Claire, sadly. They're going to um, Turtle Lake. You know, we're the eighth largest district. Um, so I think the only reason that they wouldn't come here is because they're scared of us a little bit, but that's okay. Um, but I, also, I the same thing. yeah. Um, but at the state level, there are um, some other comprehensive gun control and gun safety measures that are also currently in the legislature, um, but they're not gaining traction at this time. Last week, there were efforts to add a 48-hour wait time on firearm purchases and an attempt to ban the purchase of firearms for all people who've been convicted of domestic violence, and those are both voted down. Um, but beyond that, uh, many of you have heard of the March for Our Lives. I think all of us have. And the March for Our Lives uh, was led by the students and survivors of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, but also students from across the country. And we have a number of students from Eau Claire who have been, were at marches, um, in Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Madison. I think there are a few right now who are still doing some activism this week. Um, I think on a march to Janesville to Paul Ryan's office. Um, but uh, I would encourage you all to check out marchforourlives.com to learn more about what these students are asking for. They have five policy proposals right on the front of their website. Um, and you just click right there and they're very basic, very straightforward, and I hope that we take them seriously what they're saying thank you very much commissioner now we move to the consent resolution agenda and one thing has been removed from the agenda and that is the um, 6.12 the CISA contract which will be on for the next board meeting which is next week already okay uh, Let's see, I say, do I hear a motion, right? Okay. Um, I'll entertain a motion for 6.2 minutes of February 21, 2018. 6.3 minutes of closed session February 21, 2018. 6.4 minutes of March 5, 2018. 6.5 Oh, that was four. 6.5 February 2018 financial report. 6.6 .6 minutes of closed session March 5, 2018. 6.7 gifts in the amount of $19,862.75 for the period of February 1, 2018 through February 28, 2018. 6.8 payment of all bills in the amount of eight million twenty-eight thousand three hundred and eighty and five cents, and net payroll in the amount of three million five hundred ninety-six thousand seventy-four dollars and eighty-seven cents for the period of February 1, 2018 through February 28, 2018. 6.9 human resources employment report. 6.10 employee handbook modifications pull that okay 6.11 substitute employee contract 6.13 2018-19 dental insurance rates 6.14 referendum project bids 6.15 five-year capital plan bid do i hear a motion to approve Commissioner Bika, second. Second. Commissioner Harder. Uh, now we'll go back to the um, employee we'll handbook. Vote. We can vote on that. Oh, we can vote on All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The motion passes. And we'll go back to the employee handbook modifications. Did you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I I just thought, um, you know, uh, given Mr. Going's comments, it'd be good for the board to have a conversation about that and maybe seek clarification. I know I would maybe like a little clarification, mm -hmm. and my inclination is um, to leave the, the language as it is right now, but ask for the handbook committee and employee groups to meet as soon as they can to update the language and, and make it more specific and then bring it back to. Do you want to comment? But, it's Marks. Shall we send it back to the committee? I think that Commissioner Luganville's recommendation is fine. We'll take it back to the ERC and, and look okay. at the points that were raised and see if there's any modification that's needed, then bring it back to the board. Can I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Commissioner Harder, second. Commissioner Luganville. So the employee handbook modifications will be reviewed again by the committee. Okay. Thank you. Now we will consider a resolution. We need to uh, vote. Just oh, forget those things. I'm sorry. Okay, all those in favor of the motion to send the uh, employee handbook back to the committee for review, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Motion carries. And now uh, Dr. Hardebeck has a special recognition. So from time to time, we have uh, administrators who transition to different jobs or they transition to retirement and always take it as an opportunity to uh, recognize their service to the district. And tonight we have a principal who's making a transition back to the classroom as a teacher. Uh, Robin Jeske, where are you? I, I, you want to stand up, please? So Rob has decided that uh, to leave the principalship, he's going to go back to his first love, which is teaching. And um, he will be missed at Northwoods. Uh, he's been the principal there since uh, 2010. Uh, when he completes his service there uh, in June, you will have been there for eight years, right? Um, so Rob is moving to be a third grade teacher at Putnam Heights and I know that Principal Kohler is delighted to have you there uh, and is looking forward to your joining the faculty. Um, Rob started at Northwoods as a, uh, I think a fourth grade teacher, right at Locust Lane? At Locust Lane and then continued there at Locust Lane uh, until he became the principal. He earned his bachelor's degree at UW La Crosse and his master's degree from the University of St. Thomas. Um, so as he makes his transition to the classroom, um, I think that he's really returning to his, as I said in the beginning, to his first love. And um, you know, I can tell you in working with uh, Rob for the past six or seven years one of the things that I've learned is that he has a true heart for kids and uh, a true dedication to the profession so Rob we look forward we're gonna miss you at Northwoods but we're gonna look forward to the work you do at Putnam Heights thanks Rob we appreciate, us. appreciate your service so now the letter to parents on school safety. Do I hear a motion to approve the letter? I um, I'd I'd leave. I don't know if anyone has um, revisions they want to make, but well, I just wanted to put the motion on the floor. Yeah, I, I'll first. move it and then we can discuss. Okay, and, yeah. Commissioner Luganville's moved to accept the letter, and is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Torres. Um, are there any additions or corrections that uh, I found a couple of editorial things, but I think those have been fixed. Is there anything else? I guess I, I had a question. I wasn't sure if, if we, we wouldn't want to address editorial now, or I should have probably sent them in advance like you did, and I didn't think to do that. Well, so that's my error. I think, I think she can. We do it. Just, yeah. And I also don't want to bog down. I don't want to bog things down, though. Yeah. 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 We want to get it right. Okay. So go ahead, 
Commissioner Laura Vika. Um, well, I, um, one question I had, um, I guess that might change some of my questions about the letter, is I, it, um, it occurred to me that would the district consider uh, featuring school safety on the website as a permanent area? And that we could then, because there, I was trying to read this from the perspective of somebody who, who might not know about things that are mentioned here. And so I asked about the website because if this became more of a living document that would have links and be embedded in a larger, you know, kind of in a larger approach, especially resor you know, resources for students, parents, teachers. Would, would you care to make an amendment to the motion? An addition uh, or amendment? I don't think that's needed. Okay. Um, it's just that if I knew that that was possible, I think it would I wouldn't feel the need to put a lot more in here because it would be part of a frame, a whole framework. Okay. I mean. So what's your pleasure? I know that in the past we've we've established new tabs and we've kind of asked the communications committee to do that, like stab like at the top of the site, like we have the referendum one now, which is permanent. Yeah. So are you thinking something like up there, like a tab? Yeah. So could we? So that we could ask that maybe, th ask the communications committee to work on that. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine at first at part of that banner, a feature on the banner, and then, I mean, you know, as you're sorry to say, I mean, the, you know, this is part of the, this is part of the culture we're in now. So it's not going anywhere. Well, the letter is a one-time thing, and I think putting it on the web would be a good idea. Mostly as a resource site for anyone children all the way through staff and yeah I think that um, I think that's good because I think that I mean a lot of folks are on our web page it's a convenient place to go and they might not want to always read the long emails that we send them and long letters but that's a different place they can go and get some bite-sized things and also it allows for if administration the superintendent's office someone else wants to maybe add add a post at some point or a resource I think that's great um, just as a clarification, um, are you looking for resources for parents uh, and students and staff, uh, or are you looking for our safety plan? And I thought of it kind of as a repository for all of that. Um, so um, I certainly we can can use the website for a repository for resources. Um, I don't know how much of our safety plan we would want to make public. Oh, sure, um, on the on the website so yeah. as long as there's an understanding because we're constantly updating that and there's some of it that we want for staff yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I mean we could certainly create a website for that I had a reporter call me last week and want to know what we were doing and I said well first of all I don't know everything we're doing and secondly if I knew I wouldn't tell you because it seems ridiculous to tell everybody what we're doing for safety. Um, so, but I think that if everyone's okay, we can pass the motion to approve the letter to be sent out to families. And then, um, So in the first paragraph, because we wrote this before, um, I think what happened at Memorial had a significant impact on a lot of people. I don't, it's not just unique to my family. But so I don't know if the first paragraph, we're talking about events occurring in schools as it's removed from Eau Claire and it is no longer removed from us. So if we wanted to add to the first paragraph, including our own district. Um, After in America schools, comma, including our own district. We wanted to. I missed what you said. I'm sorry. Do you still want to use the word horrific? It's no, that wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but something that acknowledge, that would acknowledge the impact. Um, I didn't necessarily mean. I think it's okay to say they are horrific events. Um, 
in other schools, but what happened here, I, I wouldn't call that a horrific event, but we could call it, you know, just recognizing the local impact on people. <coughs> um, I don't know, Joe, you were, I mean, um, is that okay? In the way that we were thinking about it, wording-wise? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to think how to put what you're saying in here about adding, because I think that's important. Yes, that's um, incidents in Eau Claire. Yeah, I, and I don't want people to be, I, I don't know if you want you want to say Memorial High School specifically. I don't know. Okay, I d the reason I said that is because I didn't yeah, want people I to think would, other things were going on and yeah, that I we're just talking about Memorial. But school. Well, I think because we've had so many, we've had so many of these threats at middle schools. Or just threats within the Eau Claire Area School District. Right. Sure. Um, the Eau Claire might be the as well as, uh, so it would come second after the other, the other events in American schools. Yeah, right there, Pat. Are you typing, Patty? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Second paragraph. Uh, do you see where it says individual relationship, community, and society? I actually didn't know what relationship was. I would probably just say individual, community, societal. Yeah. Community right. probably covers it. Okay. So we can take out the whole And if at any point it's, if this is bogging down the process, just say so and, uh, <laughs> like, we can move on. How many do you have? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, I mean, so say if it's too much. If, yeah, is that okay? I'm just wondering how many more you have. Right. A lot? Uh, it depends, I guess. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to do it right, right here. Um, could I just do things that are not edits then, that are just court, sort of, or no? Sure, go ahead. Um, well, okay, I, uh, yeah, I can, that's all right. I can let it go. You sure you don't have other? Yeah, I can let it go. I see quite a bit on your page. Uh, that's most, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Well, whatever you have on your page, you should send it to um, Patty and Marianne so they can see what can be incorporated on that web page if it's more information. Sure, yeah. yeah that's fine. Can I hear from the other board members? Or are you all right with letting them do the Dr. Dr. Hardaback and Patty will look at the other suggestions she has. Charles, you had something too, didn't you? I just want to um, maybe bring this for uh, thinking. In light of what Dr. Haderbeck just got done saying earlier about the expectations of um, cooperation that we need from parents and students, and she also lay out the potential consequence for such behavior. I, it hits me hard that there may not be enough people hearing what was said tonight. So if a letter is to go out to every um, family members, then it ought to be uh, spelled out the same so that more people would hear about the same message. I'm just thinking out loud. A lot more like we have in, in the last bullet in the letter when we have a crisis communication plan 
maybe we can have a uh, another section uh, that explain about the expectation or uh, consequence for such behavior. And if nothing else that we want to do in the letter, maybe the website can spell out what sh she said earlier. If I may make a suggestion, um, I think we're just not quite ready to vote on this. And we, we can do uh, the rest of the suggestions and the edits this week. And we have another meeting next Monday night. And maybe it would be best if, if we just turn in our edits and uh, let Dr. Hardebeck take a look at them. And Joe, you wrote the original letters, so maybe you'd like to look at them. And then we can a wholeheartedly vote next Monday. How would that be? Yeah. Um, I don't, I think I misunderstood the, I think I don't always know what the process is. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's I okay. misunderstood the process. That's yeah. why I think, I feel, I don't want to hold things up. I would feel very settled with the idea that it's going to be part of a whole framework. And so please don't misunderstand that. Okay. It's like, you know, that I have, you know, so you needs. could vote tonight. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there might be some good things. Um, there could be, but it could also and then be. We could just bring it back. It's only a week. Um, my only feel, I do feel a, a bit of a sense of urgency. Um, and I wouldn't have said that had it had what happened at Memorial had it not happened. But it, it feels rather urgent to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charles. So, what do you feel you want to do? Do you want more incorporation of what Dr. Hardebeck's statement said, too? Well, I want to hear the rest of the commissioner's point of view, too. Because okay. I believe that the message that Dr. Hardebeck said tonight are strong, that need to be heard. And the letter, it's a medium of communication to families. Well, I feel the same way. I agree with you. Um, anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> it, yeah, it is a unique. I agree too. It's a unique opportunity to communicate with families, um, and that's an important message, I think, too. Uh, I do agree, though, with the kind of the timeliness of this of this letter. I just don't know that we can uh, kind of get both of those things. Get the the fullness of the message and address the, the timeliness. I'm, I'm not sure how to resolve it. Yes. I guess my feeling um, is I, there's not going to be a single letter that we'll be able to write that can convey everything that we want to put in there. I mean, it, that you could never stop writing a letter about these issues. Um, I do feel that a message has to go out this week. Um, it's the first week back from break. Today, a horrific thing could have happened if it hadn't been for one kid. So this is on everyone's mind. So my feeling is that we should send out a letter tomorrow. Um, and I think that what Commissioner Bika has brought to the table of having, a, having a, a, a standing presence on the district communication platforms about this issue is, is one way to incorporate everything that we can that, that comes across, you know, resources, links. Maybe it's a statement from the superintendent. May, you know, maybe it's an update on, on, a, on a given um, plan or something the safety team is doing or students are doing. So I think that it's a, it's a both and. So I think that I would suggest that moving forward with the letter and all, but also moving forward with a website and a platform where we can continue to add new things. Other speaking? Yes, Mr. Charles. Uh, we drafted this letter two weeks ago, uh, or three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago. And uh, um, I think it just should go be delivered. Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Bika's suggestion to open up a tab in the website is very good, mm -hmm. and we should, um, you know, move forward with that. And my understanding is that Dr. Hardebeck and the principals are going to discuss uh, ways in which they will address the families um, of each uh, school 
in ways that are concrete, direct, and uh, educative. Mm -hmm. So um, that will just uh, give more information to the public in, in more precise ways. But I think we, we need to move forward. Okay. Call the question. Uh, let's vote. Okay. All those in favor. All those in favor favor of sending the letter out tomorrow as planned say uh, yes. 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 All those in favor uh, not in favor of that say no. The motion passes. It's a problem trying to write a letter as a group. It really is. Okay. Now we are going to go to um, adjourn to committee reports. And I think Mr. Schmidt is our first presenter. And you're going to be talking about biannual communication plan status report. Yes. Good Thank evening. You. This is a, f um, I come to you every roughly six months to give you an update on the communication committee. It was interesting, I heard you just mention it earlier, um, so it's a good chance for us to uh, visit with what the committee's been up to and where they're going next. So we will walk you through um, a few of the um, a few of the things that have been going on. Um, again, this is related to our fifth strategic priority partnerships with families and community the pictures in this particular um, presentation have actually um, aligned with part of the communication strategy right now and that's part of our um, piece with the ECSD inspires hashtag for our social media campaign um, and so hopefully you've been seeing either through the, the superintendent uh, tweets with that hashtag and also uh, we've been trying to sprinkle in every time we can get the ECSD inspires um, message out there from with our students and families so you'll see those pictures throughout tonight's presentation we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later again this is aligns with that fifth priority area um, and so the purpose of the committee we like to um, we like to remind um, each time we do this presentation and there's a lot of redundancy in this presentation because we we try to a lot of this is the same to so develop those district-wide communication plan um, it's not a PR office um, the communications committee is more of a, of a long-term strategy. A lot of our short-term uh, communications are still done through uh, Patty Iverson and Terry Piper Thompson. Um, so this is a little bit more of that not today type thing, um, which Patty and Terry already uh, do very nicely for us. It's also to establish clear, consistent communications. Um, this is a difficult in any organization um, because everyone has in their mind uh, what those communications look like. And also finally to develop those workflows for internal and external communications. Um, and we'll get into that uh, in a moment as well. The committee members come from many different walks throughout um, district, um, and then of course Terry on the um, bottom also serves as a role out at DeLong. Um, we're gonna talk about how this group is gonna be changing um, as well too in the next few months. The role, this committee is not a decision-making committee. They bring, uh, um, they bring a lot of information to the either the executive team or um, sometimes to policy and governance. I remember we brought a big uh, chunk and we're hoping to do that again soon in the next few months. We have a few more policy and governance items to bring. Um, and then they, there's a lot, of, a lot of looping of feedback. Um, so there's, this group is, um, we understand that uh, communications, um, again, have a lot of different perspectives and it takes a bit of time to kind of move their work forward. So I want to update you on what's happened since I pre uh, presented back in August. So we have a revision of our communication plan. And actually, I'm going to pass that around. It's a draft. Yes, you are the first. Thank you. This should be easier, right? Thanks, Lauren. So passing around right now is our um, <clears throat> revised communication plan. And actually, the old communication plan well, had a lot of details to it. Um, it was much more like a checklist of things we were trying to accomplish. This is, we're, we're slowly moving the communication plan up to be almost like a, a committee version of a strategic plan, looking more at two major um, goal areas. Um, and so as that's making its way around to you, we'll, um, again, there's a big draft splash, and I think it'll permanently always have a draft on there because um, we're continuing to revise this. So this looks quite a bit different in terms of 
um, the style that the last one came to you. But again, <clears throat> it's got two major goals. And as you can see, uh, to develop, and actually I should do this on the fly. Can I make a switch, Patty, over to the, this? Can I do that? Thank you. There we go. So we're making a shift um, toward, again, um, a little bit broader look at um, developing that the brand of the district. And so there's a lot of operating. Was, I, as soon as you're talking about doing things on the website, you got my attention because um, that is part of our brand and how that looks. And believe it or not, the, we are making some changes to the website soon we'll be talking about. And the placement of everything on there is very purposeful um, to try to convey a certain message where you would expect things. Um, Any time a change takes place, um, we all get a little nervous because that's not where people expected things to be. So you can see some things in there in the communication plan about um, on goal one. I mean, then you can see those the major strategy areas, um, those four big areas, and then um, engagement area two to engage stakeholders in the brand. So the development of the brand and then engaging in the brand. And you can see the different um, stakeholders we're trying to engage with. Those are the broader perspectives of a communication plan rather than getting mired in the details. So it's trying to take that and get away for it and to, to use that more as the charter for the work going forward. All right, Patty, how do you get me back? There we go. Thank you. The next thing is um, part of the branding um, is we've actually put on RFP for um, a brand manual process. Um, we have um, we have a we approved that RFP and now that work is moving forward, bringing together a small group of representative stakeholders, alumni, um, principals, teachers, um, family members from the community. It's a small group, but they represent a lot of different um, facets to try to get um, that brand work going because again, it's it's really like a marketing campaign to make sure that we have um, a clear understanding of what the brand looks like and then how do we actually put a document together to inform our staff how to leverage our brand um, for the district. So that's the work that's moving forward. The next piece is the mission, vision, and slogan. So we have it on three um, uh, um, signs in the, in the boardroom here. We've created one with that new district blue color. Again, we shifted to a little bit more vibrant of a blue, and we have all three of those on the same um, on the same sign, and that is going to be installed over the next few months in each of the entryways of our schools as uh, families enter. So um, we had that item created and, and produced, and now it's the installation is our next step. Um, and then also our office signs. Um, one of the things we looked at is we wanted a way for our office signs to, um, if you go into, in, uh, Kay, we picked on your department. We, so here's an example of human resources. We want to have, when you walk in buildings and offices, and we're starting in this building, and then we hope to move this to offices in the other parts of the district. When you walk in, you can actually see before you enter who is, who, who is in those offices, who, who resides in those offices, and what they look like and what their role is so that you don't have to walk in kind of wondering. So that's been part of the work moving forward. And so um, <clears throat> we have the template put in place, and the next step is to install um, these in this building, and then we'll continue, and then we'll move that out to other parts of the district as well. Um, also, part of our work has been developing that consistent branding. So we finished our second video production, um, academic career planning. Um, and if you were here for part parent advisory, um, we we shared the first version of that. There's actually a small little tweak that we're putting to that, and we can share the link out to that video. It's about four minutes. Um, the initiative we talked about, the ECSD Inspires, trying to create that hashtag and communication strategy through our social media campaign. Um, we are continuing to have our annual Canvas course for principals, building secretaries, and partnership coordinators. So we deliver some of the, the, the way we're trying to, um, to develop and implement our communication strategy um, through a Canvas course, and then we follow that up, and we'll talk about this in a few moments, um, with site-level visits to work on uh, how that implementation is going at each a particular building. Finally, we update our logos. So the this logo that you see here, the one on the left, is um, we actually never had it electronically in a clean, un viral format. We finally do. So this is good news. So people were making copies of it, whatever. So we finally got it digitized, cleaned up through our graphic designer. So we're excited. That's called the stack logo. Um, we also developed another stack logo, and the difference between these two is the second one would be used in very small spaces. So if you were to put this one in a really, really teeny spot, you wouldn't be able to, you, wouldn't, you would not want this logo in a teeny spot because you wouldn't be able to read all these letters. 
neither of these, this logo down here that's, that's watermarked is, is still our logo, but these two provide you a, an option for when we are um, uh, using spaces that require a more um, square type of an opening. And then finally, we updated the logo for Flynn. Um, and again, their logo was not um, clean um, without any sort of um, problems like our first logo that I discussed. And we are um, cleaning up the logos right now, um, uh, revising the ones for Prairie Ridge. Um, there's a whole story about owls and ears that once we get that resolved, um, that one will be ready to be shared. Um, and that's they're trying to decide what the ears look like on their owl. And then um, the... Um, Northwoods, as we were talking about with Rob earlier, Northwoods is updating their um, theirs as well, and Longfellow is updating their lion. So we're actually cleaning up a lot of these logos because our logos have been all over the place. No one could find them. Um, we've, we're getting all the, Patty's nodding very nicely. Um, we're finally getting these all cleaned up in one centralized location, and this is the agreed upon logo. Please do not go use random logos that kind of look like your logo. Please use the logo. So really, and again, this is all part of that brand strategy because when you go to our website, you'll notice that there's some work that there's, if you go to different school sites, you'll notice that there's a district logo, there's a, um, there is a logo for the, that school, and they are, they're, they're supposed to be those logos, and we want to continue to make sure that they are reproducible and recognizable. If you think about all the different scamming that goes on in the world, one thing you want to be able to do is trust the messages that you're getting from schools. And you really want to make sure that, so when I see the logo come in from Flynn or any other school, we want to make sure that it's consistent and reliable, that we know that this is Flynn talking to us. And that's a lot of the, the work that we're trying to do is, is get that consistency so that people can, so that people can trust it. Um, so we've been developing some new processes. Um, we actually have an intern working with us for the first year. We're supporting, um, and it's actually funded through, um, through the actual, when, when you have an intern and the intern um, uh, earns a state certificate, you actually, it turns around and supports the funding. So it's been really kind of an exciting process um, to support um, our youth apprenticeship program at the same time, develop some marketing skills for one of our interns. And she's done a lot of, she's from Memorial, has done a lot of great work for us. Um, including our, um, we, one of the strategies we're looking at is the development of a district app, and she's done a lot of the research on our district app for us. And then the other piece has been um, our advertising for enrollment and summer school and really using social media advertising. And so this is our um, advertisement for um, our enrollment to encourage um, uh, families to enroll at the district. Um, love that picture. And this is the one for our summer school that went out on, um, this is actually a screenshot of the one that went out on social media. So really looking at um, using different um, advertising strategies to try to reach our audiences. I put continuing some new processes because they're relatively new, but they haven't been fully ingrained in the district. And that is that this committee now meets on a regular schedule every other week, or actually they meet on the Mondays when the board meeting does not meet, when the board does not meet. Um, part of that is that um, Patty's a big member, um, part, part of that committee, we want to make sure that she can be there. So we've alternated that, and that seems to, seems to have worked actually quite well for us this year. Uh, we are continuing, um, this is our second year doing site level meetings and actually getting from our buildings the perspective of how these strategies are working. Um, we hear all sorts of things from glowing praise to very pointed um, constructive criticism. So um, really trying to make sure that we um, are listening to the, um, our partners in our schools to um, try to leverage our um, our strategy to the best that we can. Um, when you onboard in our district as a new employee, you now go through a short little course on our on our branding for the district. Um, so that is something that we just developed and, and incorporated into our HR process. Um, our public events, and by the way, if you are looking for something to do on April 15th between 11 and 4, we have our next, um, I think this one is Kids Expo, um, is going to be out at um, the Sports Center. Um, let me know, or, or Emily Cooper in our office. Um, we have, we're pretty much, if there isn't a, uh, an event going on where you can rent a table, we're there now, and at least, and we are sharing whatever is timely for the district um, so that our presence is there. We'll be talking about summer school, obviously, since summer's coming up, and any other, um, any other th um, items that um, different offices in the, um, in the district want to share. Um, we, uh, there's one other thing with that. No, so we'll just, anyway, so we take volunteers um, for anyone who wants to be part of that. So let me know if you're actually interested in joining that. Again, April 15th, it's actually a Sunday, I believe, from 11 to four. The website review, this is a piece we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, we actually are going through our websites quite often um, to make sure not only does that look the, the same, but 
the way that di um, different buildings implement it because families that have children in multiple buildings expect to see certain things in certain places and sometimes we get off track and so we continue to review our websites to make sure that we have some consistency for our users and then also reviewing the policies and rules um, associated with um, policy and governance so the um, student and staff acceptable use of technology was one that um, we had um, recently done. Um, the use of visual media in schools was one that we had worked with policy and governance and we're looking towards now towards news and media and social um, social media as part of the next round of the ones we're going to be bringing um, to policy and governance and also student privacy and um, and student records. So we are also implementing some new tools. Um, we updated the district uh, we had the district update was revised. We're continuing to tweak that. Um, give you an example. That is actually how we actually invited all staff to be part of the April 15th um, date as well. Um, so that is um, that tool has um, been actually really wonderful because what ha used to the old model, Patty would send out a static PDF, and then if something got forgotten, we'd have to wait a whole week for it to be put out. Now we can get it in there and Patty can make it, it's updated live, which is really a nice feature. It has a lot of searching features that never existed before. Um, and so it's really been a much more powerful tool than we had in the past. Um, our SharePoint intranet um, development continues. Um, and our Boundary webpage, and actually in the webpage development, I wanna just show you some of the work that went through the committee. They did a real nice job. And, and of course you passed a boundary, which meant that we had some work to do, which was um, update the high school boundary to reflect the work of the the board and then for the elementary we know that we also have this little um, uh, development up here on the northeast side the high clear development and so at the elementary of course this is says locust lane this one says northwoods and this one says areas being reviewed by demographic and trends so we've been working on things like this to make sure that we're sharing a consistent message with what the board has been doing so um, that has been part of our activity as well um, and then finally, um, the ADA website work, um, there's a, there's a um, strong push across the country to make sure websites are um, complying with ADA. Um, James Martin and his team has, this has been um, tireless work. I mean, they have really ensured and protected the district um, from liability by making sure that these sites are compliant. And I have to tell you, this was no small task. So if you see James later, just you know, thank him for that because it's been some outstanding work from his team. Um, some next steps coming up. Again, we want to complete that brand manual to communicate in writing what we're trying, what we want our message to look like. Um, we have one more video that we're going to be developing, um, which is going to be about summer school, um, and then the couple logos or the three logos that um, we'll share with you next time we uh, meet. And then we have to transition. So part of the realignment with the executive team is going to be shifting the leadership of this to the new executive director of administration. So that'll be a shift for the committee in the next few months. And then some of the pieces we'll continue to do is that site level support um, and some more of those communication tools, um, looking again at policies and that reinforcing of the brand. Questions that you might have? We really appreciate all the work you and your committee have done. Thanks, James. I see you in the back. <laughs> they are uh, what's, uh, I will just say that we meet every other week, but in between the, the people on that list do a lot of work. Um, they're just very passionate about doing this and doing it well. So, um, really, they're a really great group to work with. Any comments or anything? Thank you, thank you. And you're up next on the next one. Actually, I'm going to pass the baton to Michelle Racky. So, Michelle is going to discuss with you um, a shift in what we're looking to do for um, grading at the elementary school, in particular at grades four and five. Um, at grade, um, she's going to talk to you a little bit about the history about the, the adoption of standards-based grading in the district um, and, a, and a piece that's been hanging out there for, believe it or not, about 19 years that we're finally looking to clean up. So I'll pass that off to Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for your coming in. I made an escape again. old one up here so um, I am here with uh, Melissa Greer who is a teacher at Putnam Heights and Colleen Miner who is the principal at Lakeshore Elementary and both of them have 
been very instrumental in this process of working through and looking at our standards-based grading um, that is happening at the fourth and fifth grade levels. And so um, we ask ourselves, why are we picking out fourth and fifth grade? If we look at the way grading happens at the elementary levels, in K through, grades K through three, uh, students receive just standards-based grading. When they get to fourth and fifth grade, teachers, um, they give both standards-based grading and letter grades. And so we're gonna look at the history of this, just like Jim had said, um, and we're going to look at some data that we have collected and then look at some recommendations that our group has, um, has, uh, has created, okay? And what's interesting about Melissa is she loops kids um, with her in, at Putnam, and so she teaches both fourth and fifth grade, and so she sees both of them, so. So this, um, Standards-based grading and the letter grades at fourth and fifth grade, they align to four areas in our strategic plan, academic achievement, student social and emotional growth, high quality staff and partnerships with families and community. So if we look at the history of standards-based grading, just as Jim had alluded to, that this, we started um, giving standards-based grades 19 years ago in 1999. And so that's when we started where K-3, they received standards-based grading grades, and then in fourth and fifth grade, teachers were assigning both the letter grade and the standards-based grade. And so the district, as we have gone through and we have looked at this, we are still committed to standards-based grades. We have done a lot of research on this. We have looked at what other districts are doing. Um, but throughout those 19 years, teachers, families, they have expressed concern with assigning both that letter grade and that standards grade. And so that's what got us to this point where we started to take a little closer look at it. So if we look at the philosophy of standards-based grades, um, as standards-based grading systems, when you look at them, they're based on learning outcomes. So we have learning outcomes, we have performance standards, and students receive a grade for each learning outcome or each um, performance standard. Standards are criterion or proficiency based, and so students are uh, communicated what those criteria are that teachers are looking for ahead of time so that they know what is expected of them. It separates the achievement from the effort, so you know what is to how a student is achieving on certain outcomes or performance uh, standards and it gives that effort a different score and a different area. So you really can separate the achievement from the effort. Selected assessments are used for grading purposes. The teacher decides whether or not, what do they want to show for evidence that a student is meeting that outcome? And so it could be a test, it could be a quiz, it could be an observation. Um, the teacher decides what, what is that evidence that they are going to use. And then it emphasizes the most recent evidence of learning when grading. So how is a student doing now? And, and we record that at that point in time. 19 years ago, when we adopted standards-based grade, we had to make some decisions with the Eau Claire Area School District. And we have a handbook on grading at the elementary level. And with that, 19 years ago, we decided that grades should reflect a student's progress toward the end of year expectation. So what should a student know by the end of fourth grade? What should a student know in each of these learning areas by the end of fifth grade? And then we, we, we show how they're progressing through the year. We decided that grades should be based on achievement or demonstration of skills, um, that it should be individual achievement. It should not be group achievement. And we also decided that the effort, the participation, the attitude, and the other behaviors, that we created this behaviors of lifelong learners. So we created a separate category which students would be graded with not on the achievement, but on those efforts of participation. So our behaviors of lifelong learners, these are the categories that um, we identified 19 years ago. Um, collaborative worker, community contributor, quality producer and complex thinker. And we are busy in my department, in the assessment department, of developing a data set around the behaviors of lifelong learners and how we are performing in these areas um, at the elementary level. So that's something that you will get in the near future, that data set. So I'm gonna pass it over to Colleen. 
um, and have you um, have her talk through the process that we went through to create a recommendation for next steps. Good evening, everyone. Um, one of the things that we did was we first started out as an elementary group of administrators as well as some uh, central office administrators. And we were asking, what is the best practice regarding standards-based grading and letter grading? So it was a small group of us. It was Dave Oldenburg and Michelle, Adam Keaton, who's at Flynn, Sarah Lynch, who's at Longfellow, myself, Kurt Madsen, who's at Meadowview, as well as Laura Schlichting from uh, Locust Lane. So we all met, so as a kind of a small work group, and we started looking at best practice and research about standards-based grading and letter-based grading. So that was our first part, kind of answering, you know, what's out there and where we need to move next. So then what we did based on our research is we kind of came up with a game plan of what to do. And so then we came to the all of the elementary administrators and shared what we had learned for our best of our research on best practices. And so then from there, we decided, yes, let's move forward with this. So now at this point in time, we brought the teachers involved because who is this going to most directly impact? It's going to most directly impact the teachers and our families. So we brought them together. And as a part of that plan, we created a survey so we could get feedback from the teachers in terms of what was going well, what needed to happen, so that way, in looking at best practice, that we could make the most smooth transition as possible. And is this something that we should be doing, shouldn't be doing, and just moving forward? So we created a survey. We gave it out to all of our fourth and fifth grade teachers. And we had a fairly nice uh, sample size from which to come from to actually make some good informed decisions. So from there, Melissa Greer, as well as some other teachers, and Laura Schlichting was a part of that group. And so we met down here at the board office, and we, again, looked at our research, looked at the data that we received from all of the teachers that filled that out, and said, what are we going to do? And so then from that, we had a couple of different approaches that we were going to take. Some of it could be gradual. Um, you know, maybe perhaps we do just fourth grade. Um, next year just and then fifth grade still get the letter grades and to do that or do kind of a rip the band-aid approach off what's best practice so we we had a lot of discussions about what we're going to be doing so we collected that feedback and then based with our group we came up with the recommendation of actually just beginning in the fall um, to move to obviously of course with your understanding and blessing and everything to move forward to having be just standards based grading um, moving forward but we'll go through in the data and share all that but just so you know this has been a collaborative process as we've gone through constantly looping back and getting feedback so that it wasn't just top-down remotely figuring out what this is we did get feedback going through so now we're going to continue passing it on so you actually can see what some of the data was from the teachers that shared what got us to that point So here are the results of the survey that we sent to uh, all of the teachers that give out grades at the fourth and fifth grade level. So we did send out 121 surveys and we received back, you can see, um, 63 uh, people responded back. And so we asked nine Likert scaled questions, strongly agree to strongly disagree. Most of them of them being philosophical questions about standards-based grading um, and grading in general. And really the reason behind that was we needed to understand if we did make the switch, what kind of PD do we need to offer our teachers to make a successful transfer over that and make the most successful environment for our students in the classroom. And so um, if you look at the, t I'm gonna emphasize the top question and the bottom, or the top statement and the bottom statement. The top statement is standards-based grades give a more accurate picture of what students know and can do than traditional letter grades. Really, we needed to know what is your philosophy behind this? Um, do you agree? Do you not agree? Um, but if you look at that, 82% of the teachers agree with that statement. So that gave us the understanding, okay, most of them do agree with the standards-based grading, but there still is 18% that do not agree with that. So we need to pay attention to them also. So that's where we had open-ended questions to ask, what do we need to know um, as we work through this process? Um, and through the, some of that open-ended questions, we found out that, um, that teachers, that they had a, where do I grade behavior? Where do I grade hard work? Um, and so that made us really understand that we need to come back to that behaviors of lifelong learners and we need to have some PD on that because maybe, you know, as teacher turnover has happened in 19 years, 
we haven't come back to that. So what does that PD look like so that we can really um, focus in on that um, PD for behaviors of lifelong learners? And we'll talk about some of that work we're going to do this summer. Um, and then the last one is that last statement, I support having only standards-based grades and removing letter grades. 73% of our respondents agreed with the statement that they would like just to have those standards-based grades. And so again, there is um, that 27% uh, that don't agree with that. So one of the things that, um, again, we looked at all of the respondents, you know, that was open-ended of how do we help them and what PD do we need to offer them. But for the most part in those open-ended questions, a lot of the staff, um, when they responded, they found inconsistencies with having to give a standards-based grade and a letter grade, and it was causing confusion amongst students and families. And so that was, that was um, heard through the open-ended responses. Um, but most of the teachers in the open-ended responses were for removing of that letter, those letter grades. Okay. So through all of the people that we have gotten feedback from, and the one um, group that we're going to yet um, get feedback from is going to be PAC, um, the Parent Advisory Council, on Tuesday night. So we'll be taking it there also. Okay, so um, our recommendation uh, through all of the groups and getting feedback is to have a standards-based grades at the fourth and fifth grade levels and remove letter grades starting in the 2019 school year. We want to make it consistent with K-3. We want to reduce the workload of teachers because it is a lot more work for a teacher to have to um, give a standards-based grade and a letter grade. Um, and we want to focus on the PDs to, to support our standards-based system. So that's our recommendation. And then I'm going to pass it over to Melissa, and she's going to go through um, our timeline of implementation. The group that met had a really productive discussion about how this should happen, when this should happen, um, once we reached our recommendation, and we really felt like implementing this next school year is not too soon, that we really believe that this is the best way to communicate progress to families, and so the sooner we can do it, the better. Um, it would begin with some work this April. Um, as soon as we get approval, um, we would want to make sure that all teachers, kindergarten through sixth grade, are aware this is happening. Um, we think it's important at the elementary level for all teachers to be aware, and obviously um, sixth grade teachers would be impacted if they are going to be the ones that are first assigning letter grades. We would want them to know that. Um, there is, as Michelle mentioned, a handbook on reporting to families of elementary children. Um, we started going through and um, looking at what an updated version of that might look like, um, but then again, want to wait until we get approval, um, but that would be ready to get rolling here this spring. Um, lots of work would need to happen this summer, um, and that would partly be the professional development piece um, that Michelle mentioned. Um, two teachers on standards-based grading, and especially that separation of the behaviors of lifelong learners. Um, our understanding is that teachers are comfortable with standards-based grades. We're already assigning them. Um, I think it was just clear in the comments that some of those behavior pieces are creeping into the letter grades when really we have a separate section on the report card to communicate that to families. Um, can Another I thing you, that, can I ask you a question? Oh, absolutely. What is a standards-based grade uh, look like? Is it a percentage? It's or? a number. So on the report card, so for example, in fourth grade, one of the things I report on is um, student reads and understands grade level text with accuracy and fluency. So a one is that student's beginning to meet the end of year standard. A two is the student is making progress towards the end of year standard. A three is the student is proficient at the end of year standard, and a four is the student is exceeding the end of year benchmark. Yep, you're welcome. Um, 
The, another thing we would need to do this summer is to create rubrics and checklists to help teachers um, with those behaviors of lifelong learners scores. Um, we really believe in the importance of that section on the report card. And if letter grades are removed, we want to make sure that teachers have tools that they can use um, to help them with that portion of the report card. And another piece that we talked about being so extremely important is the communication to families and that we would want that to happen multiple times. Um, we talked about this year in June when report cards are mailed out that it would make sense to include um, a notification in current third and fourth graders report cards letting them know that next year as fourth and fifth graders they would not be assigned letter grades. Um, we talked about a reminder in September um, at Welcome Back Day for families and then again at October conferences would give us a perfect time to just remind families, um, especially those fifth grade families who received letter grades this year as fourth grade students. Um, we would want to make sure that they're very clear in why um, this is happening and it's really to help them have a better understanding of their child's progress. Um, and then lastly, during the next school year, 18-19, um, we know that we have some work to do with science and social studies in particular on what a one, two, three, and four looks like um, in those two subject areas. And we know that that's something that we can tackle next school year. I have a question. Oh. Questions? Is that our next slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Perfect. Have you um, asked students um, what they think about it? Have you verified if they um, are able to understand the different levels of performance for each uh, criterion? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I have not talked to my class about it because I didn't want to approach the topic prematurely. However, what I see in students is, especially at the fourth grade level, um, when they start working for letter grades, some of them that becomes their sole focus. And that's very concerning to me um, because I don't believe at age nine and 10, you should be categorizing yourself as an A student, B student, or C student. Um, what I do see in areas like when, our, when my professional learning community team, my fourth grade team meets, and we develop an assessment that is based on a standard. For example, we recently developed one on analyzing the theme of a text, and students were graded on a scale of one through four. When they're taught what those numbers mean, that's the power, because they're able to realize, oh, I'm at a two, but I need to be at a three. And so I think just as important it is to communicate with parents, it's also incredibly powerful to communicate what those numbers mean to students as well. And how do they own the process? Do, do they uh, regularly uh, check their progress? Is time, in, is time embedded during the class time to uh, do that yep. self-analysis? And that would vary by classroom, obviously. Um, but I think that students when feedback is an extremely powerful tool. And so teacher feedback, we know, is an instructional strategy that improves student performance. And so when we're able to give accurate and timely feedback and students are able to reflect on that through our formative assessments, then that's how we hope that when it comes time for a summative assessment, students can use that feedback to then meet the bar we need them to meet. Uh, a logistical question, or maybe two, uh, is the current uh, Skyward system uh, functional to this model? And uh, finally, uh, how do you plan to manage the transcripts at the end of the year? So I can speak to the Skyward question. Right now, um, it, at the elementary level, our fourth and fifth grade math grade books are set up to manage both letter grades and standards grades. So Skyward can definitely handle a standards-based grade book. It already does so. It's just doing both jobs. Um, do you want to then talk, Michelle, about to the second question? Yeah. Um, I just want to, uh, one of the things that we do have set up in place is that 
we have it set up to the point where um, our when we enter grades into the Skyward Gradebook, they flow into our data warehouse, and um, teachers, uh, their professional learning community teams, they can analyze that data on a grade level. They can analyze that data on a school level based on the standards, based on the learning outcomes. Um, so that's huge. Skyward is. Um, it actually has been made more difficult 19 years ago when we implemented the standards-based grading with the letter um, grades. It was a very difficult process for Skyward because they had not, never done that before, um, the way that we wanted to implement it. And we were the ones that kind of blazed that road for them. Um, and so to remove that, Skyward is, it would be an easier process for us. Um, it doesn't get as muddy for us. Does that answer that question? Well, it was. Uh, I was curious oh. about about a practical. Yeah. So I think when you're talking about a transcript at an yeah. elementary grade level, For that's, example, it, that's your report card, um, and so that's an easy. We've done that with K three. Uh, we would replicate that same process going four or five. If a, one of our students were to move to a different state mm -hmm. where they don't do standard based assessment, how would that connect? They, they get. Um, they would get their report card with the standards on it so they know exactly what are the learning outcomes that student was trying to achieve at that grade level. So it communicates um, the subject area and those learning targets. So that's the information that they would have, which would be more information than they would have if they would just say, a math, I got an A in, if that Thank makes you. sense. Yeah. yeah. And the key on the report card says those exact words that I mentioned, beginning to meet the end of your standard, um, progressing toward the end of your standard, meeting or exceeding. And so if you were a receiving teacher in another state, you'd be able to see the learning target and whether the student was beginning, progressing, meeting or exceeding. So again, probably giving more information than he earned a B. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just want to I just want to thank you very much for working on this. Um, I found out that we were having our fourth and fifth teachers doing both last year during an elementary school visit, and I was kind of really surprised to hear that. Um, so I'm really happy that you're doing this. I'm excited that you're making this move. Um, to me, what you're ultimately doing, and what if we if we make this change, I think what we're doing is we're creating more opportunities for our fourth and fifth grade students to persevere as learners. Um, in the face of any challenges they face. And um, I think that for us as a board to do this would be really powerful. Um, and I think it would be affirmation, um, continuing affirmation, that we want all of our elementary students to love the process and act of learning um, rather than just earning a grade. So I will really strongly and, and excitedly support your recommendation. Commissioner Harder. Yeah, I, I agree with Commissioner Luganbill's uh, enthusiasm. I'm also enthusiastic about this this change, and I think it's a great step, particularly ideas about separating behavioral from academic, and I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, I have some, I'm interested in this topic, and I'm just a couple questions about um, the learning targets. Are they, would you, do you would you consider them to be more granular? Um, I've seen implementations of this where it's quite granular. You have things like, oh, I can multiply single digit, I can multiply d double digit, versus versions that are more geared towards standardized tests, or it, what, how, where on the spectrum would you say this falls? I think we're in between, honestly. Um, I look at some of the statements, like one of the statements on my fourth grade report card is, adds and subtracts multi-digit numbers. I mean, that's, you know, very specific. But then there's another one um, that is more like math practices based, you know, attends to precision or uses repeated reasoning um, that is a much grander um, topic. And so I do think it's a mixture. Um, I know that, th I believe that through the um, process that the district ELA committee is going through, they recently made some changes to some report card statements um, in the area of writing, um, and that was really helpful um, because it definitely feels as though 
the things that I'm teaching and assessing are really right there on the report card. Um, I know that that's yet to be taken under with reading, but I know that that's also coming as that ELA committee moves to reading um, within the next couple of years. And so it feels as though the right work is happening with those statements. They're not perfect, but I also know that there's teams that are looking at them when the different um, curriculums go under review. And so it feels as though the revisions that are being made are the right revisions. That's great. And I, I think, and maybe this speaks a little bit to Commissioner Torres's comment too about student ownership. Mm -hmm. I think my sense of it is that the more granular targets f facilitate student ownership better. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's bite-sized chunks that a student can understand, has a better potential to understand and, and take ownership of and work towards. I'm really excited about that aspect of this. And so I wonder, along with this change, um, are there other changes that we would see in the district to try and capitalize on these improved opportunities for student ownership of their learning? So yeah. I, uh, um, we, the work that we are doing with literacy, I mean, that is, it's going right into that, this where we're really looking at those learning outcomes um, and just the work that we have to do. We have identified that science and social studies, we need to start heading down that road um, so that we can just keep refining you know, the work that we are doing and making it better and better for all students to be able to achieve in our classrooms. So, and taking ownership, I think, is very important. So, it's big work. Mm -hmm. I think it's very exciting uh, work. Um, as a college teacher, I frequently got, what do I have to do to get an A? <laughs> I, you know. Fourth grade teachers get that too. Yeah, <laughs> and I was a voice teacher and taught various classes too, but it, it was, well, you're in progress, you know, and there is not a point at which it's, it's a sliding scale, really. Yeah, thank you very much for your work. Dr. Hardebeck. So, um, as we've talked in our quarterly conversations, uh, the board has indicated that they wanted to see a definition of criterias and indicators that would assess not only social emotional development but an alignment with the ECASD core values and also how those relate to the cognitive abilities and we feel that this work is a be is a beginning step to that um, that requirement that you had asked for and I think it will provide us with a basis to begin to anal analyze the impact of a program a school, a teacher, in terms of, of how we're using our resources. So we're not there yet, but through the work of this committee and through the work of the Literacy Committee, we're starting to get there. Yes. Yeah, I, I, that's great. I mean, to me, that's a huge point of this, and one of the reasons I'm excited about it is to see the, the behavioral piece broken out gives that opportunity for those assessments to be developed. I wonder, as I look at the list that's on there, you, I think, Michelle, maybe I think it was you who mentioned that was a rather old list. Um, and it's still a valid list, I mm -hmm. think, but um, we also have the dimensions of learning, which I know you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. How is that? Um, how is that bringing into this, being brought in? We haven't braided them yet, yeah. um, but there are going to be conversations around this list, you know. So when we come around this this summer and we start looking at those rubrics and those checklists, determining do we need to make adjustments to this list um, to either make it more comprehensive or less comprehensive? Um, are we missing something? So we'll really take note of that as we work through this um, and make those resources available for us. But, but yeah, I will say this, if you look at the behaviors of the lifelong learners and the dimensions of learning and the alignment that Michelle and her group did with the strategic plan, it's beginning to take shape. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not work that can be done overnight. No. Um, <laughs> right? Correct. <laughs> this uh, is big it, work. It, and it, re it requires a good deal of collaboration. Um, um, and you can see that collaboration, principal, teacher, central office staff, and they represent just a portion of the committee that's working on this. But this is exciting work, and it is what you had asked for. I'll, I'll just say one last thing. It is exciting. It's, I'm excited, and I'm thrilled to see it happening. And I wonder, have we talked about middle and high school? <laughs> 
as I said, this does not happen overnight. <laughs> but I'm I'm really inspired by your enthusiasm. <laughs> Are there any comments from the public? Oh, I'm sorry, Charles. Go ahead. <laughs> First of all, I do want to say I appreciate the work a lot, but I just want to express my own experience, and that might be generalized with families out there. I do have three children, and they've been through the same uh, system. And from time to time, I question if it's me or the system. I, I do see that there are some inconsistency of interpreting the different category, one or two or three, with the different teachers. So my main question is what kind of measurement the district has so that um, the way to apply the criteria are consistent for the whole district. I'm glad you brought that up, and that's one of the things that we um, we see we had seen through the survey results is that we think it will be very important with that professional development to come back once a year to kind of what we call norm it. What does a one mean for a student in math or literacy? What does a two mean? What does a three mean? Um, because we do have turnover of staff. And you think about in the 19 years, um, the turnover of staff that we have had. and because we don't do that every year, we do see inconsistencies. And so we need to really work with our group of principals and teachers um, and, and coordinators to look at and create that professional development so that we can start having those consistencies so we know what that one means, what that two means. And it means the same thing if I was a student at Putnam Heights or if I was a student at Lakeshore. So that way it's consistent across. So you've got that inner rate of reliability. But that's only going to come through collaboration. And so this is just going to strengthen that collaboration that we have with our teachers. So that way whatever grade a person is getting is consistent and it's not going to matter from who, who their classroom teacher is or what school that they have because we're following a rubric and we're all following it the way it's been designed. And we're having those conversations so that a one is truly a one across the district, a two, and it's not dependent upon what teacher you have. I'm going to give you a little story of, of an experience that we just had um, with our, our data warehouse and how powerful this has become in, math, in the area of math. And I would, be, I would say that this is probably our strongest area with the standards based in our rubrics. Um, we, have, we have students that move school to school in the middle of the year. And we had a, a little um, kid that he, he moved from one of our schools to Lakeshore Elementary. And um, we were doing a data warehouse uh, training on that day, and the teacher said, oh, this child won't show up in here because um, th they just moved into here. That child showed up into her grade book, into the data warehouse, and she was able to see how the student scored in all of these standards area. And she goes, I know exactly what that means. I know that the two means this because this is what the rubric identified. And it was just such powerful data that she had on that student immediately when that student entered that school. Um, so, but we are there, we're there with math, but we're not there in other subject areas yet. But we'll get, we're gonna get there. Thank you so much. Any other comments, questions? Thanks, Michelle mm -hmm. and Melissa and Colleen. Thank you so much. It's very informative, exciting. Okay, we are going to uh, go to the law enforcement officials and school resource officers discussion and possible first reading. So, is there any discussion? Yes, do you want to lead us off on that? Yeah, I can just get us started. Um, so, of course, as we've talked about tonight, school safety is an all of the above issue. Um, one powerful tool that we have in Eau Claire is our long-standing school resource officer program. The policy that you see before you tonight has not been revised since 2000. 
Um, our committee has been working on this for a little over six months now. Um, and all of us on the committee felt that it was important to incorporate the voices of not only the regular entities, but also um, other stakeholders in the public and uh, community organizations. Um, internally, as a district, we sought feedback uh, and received it from our building principals at all levels, as well as students and the Parent Advisory Council. And we also sought and received feedback in the community from the Chippewa Valley ACLU Board, the Uniting Bridges Board, and members of JONA. And um, also, we received feedback to aid us in our policy from the Sheriff's Department, the State Public Defender's Office, and the DOJ Office of Justice Assessment. Um, and finally, we had a public forum on March 12th, which, which uh, 58 community members attended and shared comments to assist us in the draft. Um, our main partner in the policy revision work has been the Eau Claire Police Department. Um, and they've, of course, been important, long-standing partners with our district. Um, and we have in the audience tonight two folks from the Oakland Police Department. We have Deputy Chief Matt Rokas, if you want to wave, and we have Sergeant Andy Wise, if you want to wave, too. Um, and these are two great individuals that we've really enjoyed working with and learning a lot from each other, I think, through this process. Um, and they'll be available as we talk about this tonight if we have any questions specific to the police department. Um, and hopefully we're able to talk through this and maybe have a first reading. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Joe. I, I want to say, I think, for the board that we really appreciate all the work that has gone into this to get a, a good policy that covers all the bases. So um, are, is there any discussion? Um, what is your pleasure about doing a first reading tonight? Everybody good with that? It's going to take a little while. So I'm going to have everybody read because it's so long. And we might go to sleep if one person reads. Um, so if uh, Joe, why don't you start us off and um, recognize the values in the governing part. And, okay. and then everybody take a, a paragraph or two as long as you want to read. And then we'll just go around, go down the row. OK. Thank you. And um, I know in the past we've. The highlighted has been new for the purposes of tonight. As you read, the red text is all new, as and the black that's not crossed out is existing. Um, but yeah, we're going red instead of highlighted this yes, time. Okay. I think because it's the majority of it. So, and we don't want you to go blind with the highlight. Okay, the Eau Claire Area School District recognizing recognizes the following values and governing principles which guide this board policy. Public education is essential to the well-being of individuals, families, and communities. For students to access and assimilate a public education, they must feel safe at school. Clearly defined roles, responsibilities, reporting protocol, decision-making processes, and resource allocations are essential. SROs play a key role in establishing positive supports for students and families. The SRO is a trusted member of staff. Students who are facing behavioral challenges or engaged in minor criminal activity are most likely to benefit from positive behavioral interventions and supports in accordance with policy 447. Access to adults who mentor and guide them and additional counseling and or supports rather than arrest and or exclusion from school. It is essential that both parties are able to distinguish between disciplinary misconduct, which is handled by administrators and staff, and illegal conduct, which may be handled by law enforcement. When possible, the board supports a restorative approach to discipline that involves all, parent, uh, all parties in the process of settling the offense. Restorative practices involve the victim, offender, and the community in search of solutions that promote repair, reconciliation, and reassurance. Meaningful engagement of all stakeholder groups, including students, families, and educators from diverse backgrounds, is essential to school safety, collaborative cultures, and positive school climate. And then, and I suppose I'll just read page one, and then we can each read one page. OK. okay. Um, so the last bit of this page, definitions, interview, questioning of an individual by a police officer related to a criminal investigation. Non-custodial interview, questioning by a police officer of a student who is not detained and not expected to be detained. A student shall be advised that he slash she is not detained, does not have to talk if he or she does not wish, and can leave any time he or she wishes. Custodial interview, 
questioning by a police officer of a student who is detained by police officers a student shall be informed of his or her constitutional rights by the investigating officers and these rights shall be given full consideration by the investigating officers Child rights, rights conferred on a minor by the Constitution of the United States, the Wisconsin Constitution, state and federal statutes, and by confirming court decisions and precedents. As a matter of law, parents, guardians, school administrators, and other third parties can neither waive nor assert a child's rights. The minor can, however, waive or assert those rights at any time. Police officer and law enforcement officer. All officers of the federal, state, and local governments charged with the duty and authority for law enforcement and the conducting of official investigations in connection therewith. School Resource Officer, SRO. School Resource Officers support and facilitate the educational process by providing a safe and secure environment through building and establishing meaningful relationships with students, staff, and families. SROs proactively interact with the school community to ensure the enforcement of city and state laws preservation of public order, protection of life, and prevention, detection, or investigation of crime. SROs work effectively with students' families, school personnel, and community agencies to support safe teaching and learning in the schools in accordance with the ECSD and the Eau Claire, Eau Claire Police Department policies. While authorized to act independent of school district policy in response to criminal conduct or an immediate threat, the SRO is not typically the primary responder or, or investigator of disciplinary investigations or behavioral issues that arise on a school campus or at a school-sponsored event. Continue. Continue. Okay, sure. <laughs> law enforcement officials in the schools. The district recognizes that collaboration between law enforcement agencies in the district is necessary for the protection of students and employees, for maintaining a safe environment in district schools, and for safeguarding all school property. At the same time, the district recognizes its responsibility to protect the educational process and to provide for the concerns of parents, guardians, regarding the, regarding the welfare and rights of their children. Law enforcement officials may be called to the school when district officials have reason to believe that unlawful conduct may have occurred in situations that threaten the safety of students, employees, or the public, or when the expertise of law enforcement is required, for example, to conduct a search for suspected weapons possession. In these situations, law enforcement and school district officials shall work together to conduct necessary investigation efforts, including conducting student interviews in accordance with board policy and established procedures. Law enforcement initiated student interviews and investigations concerning conduct not related to school shall generally not be conducted on school premises except as provided in this policy in the case of emergencies, including a belief that a student has information regarding imminent or ongoing criminal activity requiring immediate conduct or as specifically required by law, including consistent with okay, we'll you, uh, terms of any judicially issued warrant. That's okay. Yeah. We can just fix that. Problem. Yeah. I think uh, it's just the elimination of including. Yeah. Yeah. Include? Okay. We'll pretend you didn't read it. Yeah. Okay. School resource officer, SRO. Selection of SROs. Working with the Eau Claire Police Department, building principals, one parent, guardian, and an executive team member shall shall be involved in identifying the knowledge, skill, and disposition criteria for SRO candidates and in the selection of new school resource officers. Training of SROs. The ECSD shall work with the ECPD to provide opportunities for any new school resource officer to go through training on the following topics. Knowledge of Eau Claire community core values and district strategic plan, mission, and vision. Child and adolescent development. Ability to interact appropriately with students at all levels. Cultural competency, implicit bias, i.e. race, ethnicity, immigration status, LGBTQ status, socioeconomic status. Knowledge of federal and state disability, anti-discrimination and special education laws. Knowledge of ECSD reporting, including seclusion and restraint policies. Knowledge of positive behavioral supports, strategies and interventions. Knowledge of student rights, confidentiality, and privacy. Knowledge of trauma-informed practices. Training in de-escalation techniques and nonviolent crisis intervention. Responsibilities of SROs, law enforcement, as told by them and shared with school administrators. 
uh, school-based mental health awareness. The school district shall identify resources available to SROs and school staff, some of which may be from state and national organizations that facilitate professional development opportunities. SRO access to student records. A SRO must contact a building administrator in order to obtain access to student records, which are not law enforcement unit records maintained by the school. Student records include a student's attendance and contact information. Student grades shall not be made available to SROs under any circumstance. A SRO who seeks to access pupil records, aside from the officer's agency's own law enforcement unit records, may be provided access only as permitted by law and only after providing certification in writing to a school official that any records provided will not be further disseminated by the SRO. SRO interviews. It is the role of the school administration to investigate school-based issues and to determine when the assistance of the SRO is appropriate. SRO shall not act as a school disciplinarian. Disciplining students is a responsibility of school personnel in accordance with policy 447, student discipline and positive behavior interventions. School administrators may request the assistance of the SRO in an investigation and consult the SROs in the event the administrator has reason to believe a circumstance exists that negatively impacts the school and or learning environment. In the event that law enforcement officials and or SROs intend to interview a student on school premises during the day, the officer shall confer with the building principal or designee unless an emergency circumstance arises where there is risk of harm to the health or safety of the student or others. If this occurs, the law enforcement official and or SRO shall notify the principal or designee as soon as practicable. In consultation with the SRO, a school administrator may attend student interviews when necessary and appropriate. If a student is interviewed by law enforcement officials without a parent or guardian or administrator present, the principal or designee shall explain the circumstances for this and place it in the student's file. Shall we move on? If a request for a student interview. If a request for a student interview is denied by the building principal or designee, they shall state the reason for such denial. Law enforcement officials and or SROs may request review of that decision by the superintendent. SRO accommodations for students. The SRO may work with an interpreter service to accommodate students who speak English as a second language and or students with disabilities. Notification of parents, guardians prior to interview. Prior to any interview of a student who is the victim, witness, or complainant, except in case of an abuse situation, or if the student is believed to have information relative to an imminent threat or criminal activity, the SRO or principal shall attempt to contact the parents, guardians, unless otherwise requested by the officer, the principal, or the principal's, or in the principal's absence, their designee may sit in on the interview, if contacted, a student's parent guardian may be permitted to attend the interview at the discretion of the principal. There may be situations where parents' guardians are not permitted to attend such interviews for law enforcement and the principal believe that this would impair the investigation. Interviews of students in schools related to abuse and neglect. Any contact with parents' guardians in an abuse or neglect case shall be made by human services or law enforcement, offi law enforcement officials. Governing law. Assuring all law enforcement contact with students is handled consistently with the student's legal rights, including constitutional protections, Wisconsin law governing custodial interview of minors, and any other legal requirements governing the interaction between law enforcement officials and juveniles is the sole responsibility of the law enforcement official. Immigration status. The Eau Claire Area School District and Eau Claire Police Department shall not collect or provide information regarding the immigration status of district, of district students. SROs shall not have a role in the removal of undocumented students. Complaints and allegations of misconduct by law enforcement officers and SROs. The Eau Claire School District and 
Eau Claire Police Department welcome inquiries and complaints about questionable performance actions, policy, or procedures relating to the school resource officer program. The SORO, SRO program shall set forth a simple and straightforward mechanism for any student, parent, guardian, teacher, principal, or other school administrator to submit a complaint orally or in writing of perceived abuse or misconduct by SROS. One, parent guardian shall be permitted to submit a complaint in their native language in accordance with the Eau Claire Police Department Policy 1008. Personnel complaints. The policy and complaint procedure is available online at, um, yeah, I don't have to read that. <coughs> Second, complaints to the district shall be investigated and involved, uh, resolved in a timely manner, and complaints shall be furnished with a written explanation of the investigation and resolution. Three, if requested, the district shall provide for a independent investigation through Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction into the allegations in the complaint. For where allegations of abuse or misconduct are raised, the Eau Claire School District and the Eau Claire Police Department shall investigate and work to resolve the, the issue in the best interest of the students and the learning environment. Five, where allegations of abuse or, ne or misconduct are substantiated, the Eau Claire School District and the Eau Claire Public, uh, Police Department shall consider the appropriateness of their assignment as an SRO. Six, every student, parent, or guardian in the school system shall be informed of the complaint procedural in parent uh, slash student's handbook. Seven, any complaints against an Eau Claire police officer may be referred to the Eau Claire and Fire Commission in accordance with Wisconsin statutes. Sure, <laughs> thank you, teamwork. Memorandum of Understanding, MOU. The Eau Claire School District and City of Eau Claire Police Department shall maintain a Memorandum of Understanding for the School Resource Officer Program. The MOU shall be reviewed on at least an annual basis. Accountability Reporting. With assistance from the Eau Claire Police Department and the SROs, building principals shall collect, maintain, and share data as requested on the following. One, students arrested, ticketed, or otherwise receiving formal contact by an SRO or other member of law enforcement on school property. That information shall include the A, type of offense and if the case was referred for charging, B, name of student, C, information on the daily interactions a SRO has with students and school staff. Two. The data shall capture activities that describe what an SRO does on a typical day. This information may be used to evaluate pro program efficacy. Data regarding the Student Resource Officer Program shall be reported annually to the school board. Survey slash community, community input. School and community climate surveys shall contain questions related to the SRO program. Policy review. This policy shall be reviewed annually by the Eau Claire Police Department and Eau Claire Area School District. Okay, and then we have all the cross-referencing underneath. Is there anything, any questions anybody has? Okay. Well, we'll probably bring that back. Did you have a comment? Or? Oh, okay. Anybody have a comment on this? Would our police officers like to make a a comment. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mark. 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I just ask a quick question? Oh, uh, Mark Goings, E17450, County Road of e Augusta. Um, <laughs> my quick question is, we have hundreds of students at our high schools that are 18 and older, and this had a lot of discussion about, you know, minors and parents and stuff like that. Through an 18-year-old person's lens, does this read differently? And would it ever apply differently? And should, if it applies differently, should that be represented some way in either this policy or like a sub policy or something like that? So just, just wondering clarification. I can't answer that. So I would assume Joe or one of the policemen. I'll, all I can say is that we talked about it as a committee um, in the sense of, of that we do have, I, I recall that we talked about it, of, you know, if there's a student who's an adult, and I know that we talked about it specific to like what kind of communication is sent out to, stu to a student or what are they made aware of when they turn 18. So I know we talked about that as a committee, but I don't think that we discussed putting it in the policy. I think it was more operational. But I, um, if people think we should add something. I, I guess I would like to know um, what the students' understanding of SROs are. And, and how they function in the school, and who gives that information. Does the principal, does the SRO have a session where they talk to all the students, do, do the students, or the policemen? Uh, well, at the beginning of each year, we have like the freshman orientation, so I think it's a good, a good place for that, could be that, or we do have at the beginning of the year, we also have each grade level have a meeting with the building principal. So we have a meeting with Mr. Volk every year at the beginning of the year. That'd be a great time to do it. I have never seen that happen, no. The, um, I, I would just add to we um, parts the parts of this policy that wouldn't apply to a student who's 18 or older would be specifically. I mean, the, the pieces about child rights where they can waive or assert those rights and pieces about that. So um, we tried to make it all encompassing. So parts of this policy will not apply for all students. Um, it'll depend on their specific situation. I think to answer kind of what you're talking about, Catherine, with the, the student piece, that was probably some of the more interesting feedback that we received is because we, we got student feedback as a committee. And we also heard um, in, in the forum, in the panel as well, but from that student feedback about how important that relationship is with the school resource officer and that that's really the the, the crucial part of, of them being there. So that was really interesting for us. And we tried to, in the, um, the section just talking about defining what an SRO is, who an SRO is, we hadn't really defined that as a district before. And so in doing that definition, we in include a lot of that in there about that their role in supporting safe teaching and learning in the schools through facilitating that environment, through relationships with students and staff. So, My impression is that SROs try to keep a low key and just build, re build relationships with students. Am I right? Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Question. Uh, in the section for accountability reporting uh, towards the end, uh, letter B, information shall include the name of the student. I would request uh, for it to include uh, gender and race. The, um, we, the, all I would say is we did talk about that in committee, and the only reason we didn't say that is because if we have the name of the student, we already have that data. We don't need that from anyone else because we have that in, um, in Skyward. So we don't need them to additionally report it to us because we will have it there. That's that's why we talked about it in the that, at least that's when we talked about it in committee. That's what I recall. Commissioner, did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? I, I would I would say that it would uh, save um, time to consolidate the information in just one document. It doesn't hurt to add those items. Right. I um, I think we would consolidate it in the end. I th I th if I'm recalling correctly, when we had this conversation, we're asking that the um, 
that th they would collect this data really on like a snapshot on the spot of their interactions and this adding those additional things that we can easily have at our disposal um, maybe would not be a good use of their time if we already have it and we don't need them to necessarily look it up and add it when we were we could just have that ourselves so but if but if people want to add it we uh, I recollect uh, from the conversation that uh, they were uh, in agreement to collect that data because they didn't organize it following race and gender. Yeah, I'm requesting. Race and gender. I gotta say, I'm not convinced we need to do that. But we can talk about it at our next board meeting mm -hmm. for further discussion. Okay. So I guess for me, as a, as a district committed to anti-racism, I would think that one place you would want that to be significantly reflected is in an SRO policy. And so there is language here. I guess it, it approaches the stance, but it doesn't quite get there for me personally. And I, so what, what I propose, um, I would like to include something right away in the values and governing principles that is a statement of anti-racism. Um, and so I looked for some language actually from police department, written by police departments, and I, I can offer some language now or I can send it. Uh, yeah. Because if you want to okay. read it, can we read it yeah, in the so, record? Oh, see, that's my concern about putting race and gender. Well, um, I'm thinking about the public forum and some things that um, participants, one thing that participants mentioned was that the research literature on SROs is characterized by mixed findings. So for example, there are higher rates of arrest of students of color in buildings with SROs. Um, an audience member mentioned concerns about the school to prison pipeline. And something that was not um, said explicitly but that came out in conversations afterwards. And I want to say, actually, kind of led by some of the police officers who were there, is just acknowledging a history of police brutality um, per perpetuated against people of color in the United States. And so that we have to acknowledge that history. And I think it necessitates that any contemporary policy is an anti-racist policy. So do you have a um, again, just, just something, uh, just for initial reactions, we could say something like, uh, as a district committed to anti-racism, SROs assigned to the ECASD will serve without prejudice, will not tolerate hate or bigotry in our school community or from other officers, will confront intolerance and report any such conduct without question or pause, and will pursue justice with compassion and respect the dignity of others. So and that's kind of, uh, again, thanks to an officer who recommended the Toronto Police Department and also um, San Francisco Police Department as possible models there. Do you want to put it so at the bottom, at the top, in the middle, where do you think it would fit? Um, I would put it as the very first item, but um, I would put it at the very first, as the very first value. That's me personally. I guess um, it may flow after the very last bullet point That's about the I stakeholders. When you were saying that, yeah. not what I thought. But. Although I would actually, this is my only other second suggestion here, is to change the word including to strengthen that language to something like especially or particularly. Or, you know, especially students, families, and educators from diverse backgrounds. So 
so. Can you make sure she has your wording, please? Is everyone okay with putting that as the last bullet under the guiding principles? What she read? I thought it was our new question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's what we'll do. Individually considered resolution at the next board meeting. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm ready to move on if you are. So the next item on our agenda is discussion of possible first reading of policy 345.5 academic recognition system. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so this policy um, was brought up, uh, changing this was brought up by Commissioner Fager when she was still on the board to update this, and it led to the creation by our policy and governance of a subcommittee um, uh, made up of students, teachers, counselors, principals, um, and others uh, to look at our academic recognition system in the district, and um, they came up with a um, a pretty a pretty succinct policy and there will be more specific rules that will be developed to uh, implement that um, but uh, that's what you see here and it's um, and our two student representatives were a part of that so thank you to them uh, and thank you to Jim Schmidt for being kind of leading that and uh, Patty Iverson for taking all the minutes for that group they do care to read that and and what was the part in there you wanted one word added? Because I'll, So I'll make sure I read that into the minutes. Uh, on the second paragraph, after academic achievement, uh, include and growth. Okay. Is there anything else anyone wants to add to it? So you, the only thing I thought about, would it, I don't know who, I don't, kind of the user friendliness of this policy, but would it help to define with just within the policy what the district has for its um, there's a, a Q&A about post-secondary readiness on the website and would it help to have a, some a, just one small paragraph from that it's, it's telling what post-secondary readiness is it clarifies that it's for you you know for your university technical college military etc you know just just when families see this that they I think this there's word, some, just use this word just this, this that paragraph because I think there's some sometimes there's um, misunderstanding that post-secondary only means a four-year college uh -huh. we, we have statements various places yeah we have statements various places that identify more than just four-year college it, it can be is whatever the student can we say it is a vision of the school board to promote post-secondary success as defined in thing X mm -hmm. for all students. Because, and, yeah, and because figure out it what can be a technical college, military, or yeah. you know, there were four, I think four of them. What's the name? Do you know the name of that sheet? Is it a... Uh, this was a... It's part of a, a whole um, yeah. narrative about post-secondary readiness on the web page and this part is of specifically Q and A I think we have it in some other policies too so um, can we could we find try to maybe find that after this meeting before next Monday and then put put those links at the bottom under the cross-reference so anyone maybe that's the best place to put it then so anyone who sees the document sees it there would that work yeah. okay so we can do that then before just have a cross-reference so then people can pull up the definition quickly okay all right do you, is that is there anything else people okay 
It is the vision of the school board to promote post-secondary success for all students. The school board values academic achievement and growth and recognizes students who have excelled during their high school careers. ECASD will construct a Laude system that honors academic achievement and growth through multiple measures. The Executive Director for Teaching and Learning will oversee the development of the ECASD Laude system and its criteria. Any comments from the audience? Okay. Seeing none, are we ready to um, put this on the agenda for next time it, with this addition that Lori has suggested? Okay. All right. Uh, are there any requests for future agenda items? I would like to. Um, get the agenda setting meeting uh, decided tonight. Um, I talked to Chris today and she, who is our person? Okay. She, she and I, and I don't know about Dr. Hardeback, are available between 9.30 and 11.30 on Wednesday or Thursday morning. Thursday morning? Is that going to work for you? It will. Is, I, just, I just want to make sure we have time because the agenda will have to be prepared the next day. <laughs> I know. Yeah. What time? What, what about you, Thursday morning? Until. <laughs> oh, you do. So what about Wednesday afternoon? Uh, after three. Yes, I can. Uh, I do. Oh, it's a holiday. Friday. Well, can we let's see what was Wednesday morning for you? You had. You know, if you have a, if you have another morning that you can make it, uh, I mean, I'm comfortable with your going ahead with the agenda, and then if there's something that needs to be tweaked or something, we could do it by email. What was Wednesday morning like? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Meetings adjourned. <laughs>